Welcome to the Firewater Review, a podcast dedicated to whiskey reviews. On today's show, we will be reviewing two different bourbons from M.B. Rowland. We are joined by a very special guest, the owner and master distiller at M.B. Rowland, Mr. Paul Tomaszewski. I am your host, Seth Brown. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Aaron Cave. How's it going, guys? Going good. It's it's great, and I'm laughing because uh, if y'all hear any snarling and growling in the background, that's um, our new Chihuahua puppy that we <laughs> happen to have gotten. That's uh, ferocious, and it, it it can take on the world. Oh, it's a good guard dog. <laughs> good guard dog. Oh man, hey, I'm glad to have you on, Paul. I'm I'm so glad you could make it. Yeah. Well, thank y'all for having me. Did I get your name right? Thomas I Shevsky? think you did. Yeah, Thomas yeah, Shevsky. Yeah, I think you, you nailed it. All right, good. Paul had to teach us right before we hit, hit record. So, yeah, thanks for coming on, man. I'm very excited about this. So, as I think most of our listeners probably know, Aaron was there in beautiful Pembroke, Kentucky, in Christian County, just one county over from my old stomping ground of Madisonville, Kentucky, there in western Kentucky. Uh, but Aaron was there just uh, two or three weeks ago for a barrel pick with Paul. So, Aaron, do you want to talk a little bit about that and uh, maybe give a yeah. better introduction to Paul than what I could probably give? Yeah. Um, I, I don't remember which show it was, but we uh, it was right when I got back. We recorded a show, and I kind of went into the whole – experience that I had. And uh, I don't know if you listened to that show or not, Paul, but I, I pretty much flat out said, yeah, I've done probably six, seven barrel picks. And the one I did with you, I think was by far the best barrel pick I have ever been on. Um, I mean, it was just so intimate. You were there with us, tasting through everything with us. I mean, what we went through four, four bourbons and you know, we weren't a hundred percent on any of them. And we, like, you took us right back up and pulled what, two, two or three more samples. And we found the, found the barrel that we wanted. Uh, and then you went on and, you know, let us back up to kind of plunder your whole stock. I mean, <laughs> we went through the, <laughs> went through the rise, the malt and my God, that hemp, that hemp whiskey. I'll tell you what, bread and butter pickles for days. It's definitely different. Oh man. It's, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, you, you got some great stuff going on there, and uh, I I just enjoyed the pick so much. I mean, God, I've never smoked a cigar on a pick before, so come on, <laughs> come on. It was just uh, it was phenomenal, and I like, again, He's I just want to thank you for having like, us. Uh, they go hand in hand, you know. Cigars I know. And I know. So uh, yeah, you just made made it. You just put that personal touch on it, and uh, honestly, I can't wait to come back and pick one of those rye barrels. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I know, man. <laughs> that 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 one was that first one was so good, and uh, we'll we'll get into all that later. So, with that, Paul, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you started the distillery, uh, whatever whatever you want to talk about. Um. Well, the thirty uh, second bio is I was I'm originally from the New Orleans area as I told y'all, and um, came up here to Western Kentucky through Fort Campbell while I was in the Army here, which uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the layout of Western Kentucky, we're about, uh, we're pretty long hike from Central Kentucky, Louisville, Bardstown, all that area, a good two and a half or so hours, but we're only about 50 minutes from Nashville, Tennessee, and um Fort Campbell hugs the state line on, on the Tennessee and Kentucky side. And, um, we are, I mean, literally within view of the main airfield that goes in, we watch planes and helicopters almost by the hour going into Campbell army airfield. And, um, this, this location, uh, backing up when I was in the army, I was, literally having that thought of what do I want to do when I grow up if I get out of the army and, and I did and the thought was well craft distilleries particularly focusing on whiskey were a very new concept and this was in 2007 so 10 years ago and as far as the um the layout then I I thought oh wow this is really 
blowing up, if I only knew, uh, back in <laughs> 2007, I'm like, this is blowing up and, and this is interesting. And this is a lot like what happened with the craft beer movement, uh, you know, really in the 90s, early, mid 90s and so on. And I sort of saw it coming, thinking to myself, this is going to happen. How long it takes is really, you know, the question mark. And so the thought process was, okay, I'll get out of the army. I'll get a real job and we'll sort of see how we can put together. I say we, my wife and I, we can put together a, a plan for having a small scale whiskey distillery over here in Western Kentucky. And so what ended up happening was a piece of land right down the road from where we were, where we were living at the time came up for sale it was an Amish dairy farm. And we couldn't afford to buy all the land, so we bought the buildings and some land, and there was a local farmer that got the land, which is now farmed with corn as we speak. But we're we're smack dab in the middle of about 125 acres, so we're in this nice enclave um, in the southern part of Christian County. And as far as the actual history goes of this area, there is some distilling history, but it's not wide and, you know, uh, hugely tied to, you know, your hereditary lines like you have in central Kentucky. But this is, you know, largely the same type of area that is, is great for making bourbon and whiskey when it comes to the climate and the water and all that great stuff. And so this was, this was an easy situation as far as working that in or working in this location for all of that. Now, we were really one of the first distilleries in this part of the country. Um, reason being, on the Tennessee side, you could not have a distillery except in a few counties the way the law was written back then. And then on this end of the state line in Kentucky, you know, this is western Kentucky. And Seth, you know this being from here, you know, you, you don't have an expanse of distilleries like you do in central Kentucky. Right. That's That's changing. I mean, literally by the by the month almost, we have several distilleries in this within a, a short drive of here now on both sides of the state line in Tennessee and Kentucky. But as far as um, this location goes, it ended up just being fantastic for both the production side, but then also location wise, we always thought we wanted to be able to bring people here and visit and, uh, you know, do the whole hospitality side of the business with tours and tastings. And uh, this property is a mile from I-24, one of the main arteries going to Nashville. And, um, you know, it, a lot of that has, I would say, gone past what our thoughts were initially. Uh, but then at the same time, whenever we put in the distillery, you know, this, and it still is somewhat of a isolated rural location, but I mean, this was not a typically traveled uh, type of tourism venue like you would think of when you go up I-65 or the Bluegrass Parkway in central and well, really central Kentucky. Anyway, so things have evolved and, um, you know, we started very, very small with a 100 gallon pot still, and we've gone to a 600 gallon operation where we now have the capability to put away a barrel or two of, of bourbon or whiskey a day. And, uh, you know, our biggest problem now is we're starting to run out of space and we got to build more, you know, aging warehouses or have spaces that we can actually put barrels into. That, that's a good problem to have, I think, isn't it? It is, um, especially when now we're starting to pull, I wouldn't say more bourbon than we're putting away because we're always putting away more than we're, than we're dumping, but we're starting to pull a whole lot more than we ever have. And our focus, whenever we started, we really wanted to push the whole bourbon and whiskey side of the business, but we ended up starting with clear spirits with moonshine and some flavored spirits that are still very fun and, and great and enjoyable, but we always wanted to be about bourbon and whiskey, and, and at this point, our production is 95% that, and so we've really gotten to that point where we wanted to be, and, uh, you know, the, the fun part now is evolving that. And a lot of that is some of those other whiskeys that, that Aaron was alluding to the rye whiskey, the hemp to bourbon, the malt whiskey, and a lot of that other stuff, which it's, you know, that's not a huge amount of our 
daily production, but it's it's a lot of fun, and it's something that uh, it, that's the good part about being a small distillery is you can do that kind of stuff on your own schedule versus needing you know corporate decision making process. Yeah, you mentioned some of the products. Talk, I mean, you you have a pretty big portfolio of products for such a small craft distillery. I mean, a lot of it is, you know, the various moonshines, but, but talk a little bit about the different products that you guys have. Yeah, we've got the unaged moonshine, which is made with corn and sugar, sort of a traditional recipe, but um, probably the most interesting unaged spirit we came up with early on was our black dog, which is made with corn that we actually smoke in a, tobacco barn setting much like tobacco is smoked around here or dark fired is the term here in western kentucky and it's a very small area in western kentucky where that is done it's not widespread around the state and we sort of stole that process if you want to call it that and we use that to smoke this corn and we make that started making this unaged spirit that we termed black dog obviously a take on white dog and so many people were just so enthralled with the uniqueness of that product because it wasn't just, hey, the, a corn whiskey or moonshine or something simple. It's almost like a mezcal mm. and just really interesting and really a unique expression of the local area here in western Kentucky. So the cool part is, is now that we're focusing on whiskey – we take that same recipe and we use that for two different products right now. One is our dark fired bourbon, which is aged in a, of course, a new charred oak barrel. And then we have a dark fired whiskey, which is aged in the bourbon barrels. So those are two different products we make with that particular recipe or mash. Um, our standard bourbon mash is, is done with 78% white corn, 17% rye and 5% malt. And that white corn, which is the same white corn we use for all of our, bourbon or whiskeys if we're using corn uh, in any part of the mash is right here or, or grown locally right here in Christian County. And we get it from Christian County grain, ironically the name. And, <laughs> and, and it's, it's got a very unique flavor compared to yellow corn, at least in my experience. And of course my opinion, but I mean, it's, it's uh, something that we can do because we're small. If we were, if we were churning out, you know, 50, 100 barrels a day, we probably couldn't do all of that or all of that, you know, there's not enough white corn to go around, at least not locally here to be able to make that volume. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you actually started talking about the dark fire because that's one thing I wanted to hit on because that was something super unique that I've never heard of before. And when I was at the, at the distillery and you let us try it, I mean, I, I thought it was phenomenal. And I'm not gonna lie, I kick myself daily for not bringing a bottle home with me. Uh, I and I just I, I don't know I don't know why I didn't pick up a bottle because I picked up I think three bottles when I left and <laughs> uh, you know uh, but I will be we'll be back down at some point. But yeah, it was really it's it's really a cool uh, cool thing you're doing there. Well, the um, when we started off, of course, we had more moonshine than whiskey or bourbon not even necessarily by volume, but also by number of products. And now we're starting the transition to not to dovetail anything, but to eclipse that so that we have more whiskey and bourbon products versus moonshine. So mm -hmm. we're about to get into our first batch of rye whiskey in the next few next month or two. And then of course we've got a wheat whiskey, a malt whiskey and some other ones. So, you know, eventually what you'll see if you come here is we'll have 10 or 12 different whiskeys that we'll have regularly. That's not to say, of course, we'll have stuff that we do on a, uh, you know, temporary or one-time basis. We call it a single mash. Uh, but then you've got the, uh, the fun of, of how you distribute that and what kind of volume you make. And that's what we're going to have to figure out as we, you know, move forward and, decide to make more product, how much of this do we make versus that, you know? Um, but, you know, we don't have the volume to be able to send product out to 50 states or internationally or anything like that. So we're going to have to make decisions based on, okay, where do we want to send product? What do we want to focus on and what products do, do we want those to be? Yeah. 
Well, you know, I, I think that's where the, the craft distilling industry is kind of, you, you mentioned the craft beer uh, industry. It's kind of almost aligning with how that has gone because there's still some very, very popular craft beers that aren't available nationwide. It's just kind of in their localized area, but they're, mm -hmm. you know, renowned throughout the U S and I think that, that just the process of it and being smaller and being more nimble. Yes. You don't have the amount of products that some of the larger distilleries have, but you're able to, I would think at least anyway, kind of pivot and do something different a little quicker than what some of the larger distilleries would be able to do and allow you to come up with some of these product. Yeah. On product, you're right. And, and one thing that I have noticed with the market and I say the market, I mean the consumer out there, is, a, you know, as little as one or two years ago, the expectation was you put out a product and they expect it in their liquor store because that's what they're accustomed to with your larger distilleries. Mm -hmm. If Jack Daniels makes a new product or Jim Beam makes a new product and they hear about it, whether it be uh, in a magazine or, or in something like this or just on the internet or a write up or whatever, they're thinking, okay, when can I get it? Where can I get it? And, um, you know, how much can I get over time? Whereas it ain't going to be that way for craft distilleries or it's not that way. And it, it largely the, the consumer starting to understand that particularly the demographic that is below the age of 50 understands that, Hey, this, this is something I may never see in a liquor store shelf near me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that, that could be a good thing. I mean, well, I guess in a weird way, that could be a good thing because it, it's kind of the supply and demand type thing because you put out a good product and people can't get it. Well, that just makes them want it even more, I would think. I mean, you, you, you think of the, uh, the Joseph Magnus stuff that's coming out of the D.C. area. I mean, you know, through a lot of the, the bourbon industry, people are really raving about that stuff now, but you can't you know, it's just not available anywhere. Right. And, you know, as time goes by, I think that'll make it fun. You know, you're, you're going to have your hit list of different things you want to get. And it's already happened that way. Not that I'm trying to necessarily compare it to this, but I mean, it's happened that way for years with scotch. Yeah. With certain bottlings and expressions of single malt scotch that you can't get unless you're in a certain specific area, whether it be say Chicago or, New York or uh, L.A., San Francisco or wherever they decide to sell the stuff. The one good thing about Kentucky, for those that are in it and near it, is for the most part, anything made in Kentucky is going to, you know, hit the ground there. Yeah. So what um, what do you see as one of your biggest challenges right now? Um, I would say it honestly is, is as we grow where do we send product and in what form is that as far as volume and which products we can or decide to send to certain areas? Um, you know, there's, there's certain States or places that, you know, we sort of are like, okay, we don't want to focus on that, whether it be because of the legal side of it from a regulatory standpoint, how you can market your product in that state compared to other areas. Uh, some in some cases it's geographic. It's as simple as okay, well I can drive to Tennessee, Indiana, Chicago, but I can't do that if I want to say go to Washington State. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So so that, that's really going to be our biggest challenge is is where do we want to send product? And then at the same time, we don't want to grow too fast because I don't want to send establish a distribution network with say five states and then four out of those five states, I really can't provide the product in any real amount. And we start losing shelf space and interest from the consumer because, you know, there is not putting this down. This is what we're part of, but there, there's definitely now and going to continue to be a very uh, aggressive market with craft distilled whiskey, especially as certain distilleries start being able to put out a more mature product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can can you uh, talk a little bit about um, how you distill your bourbon? Because uh, that's the one thing that fascinates me about what you're doing is the, uh, the such the low proof 
and the uh, no water added, unchill filtered. I just love all that. And I just wanted you to kind of talk a little bit about that. Well, when I got interested in whiskey, which was uh, in 2004, so not too terribly long ago, you know, and started studying and understanding the nuances of different production techniques. I thought about when, when we wanted to actually make product, I thought about it from the standpoint of as a consumer first. And I thought about, well, how do I want to make this product? How would I want to make this product or how would I want to buy it? And sort of thinking through the long term, looking at, okay, there's going to be a hundred craft bourbons or whiskeys down the road. I want to be in that top five or 10 as far as uniqueness, as far as authenticity and just the overall technique and the way that we make our product. And so we basically make our whiskey or our bourbon very, very inefficiently. (laughs) And, and what I mean is, is we pot distill it. We distill it at that low proof, like you were alluding to Aaron, we distill it at 110 proof, which is pretty darn low. And then we go straight into the barrel as opposed to distilling it at, let's say, 140 proof and cutting it back to 125. And then when we dump it, we dump it as if you were tasting it out of the barrel yourself. Um, Whereas, you know, if if we were to put it in at 125 and cut it back to 80 or 90 proof, we'd obviously have a lot more volume to play with. And, of course, the whole chill filtration and how that comes into play, I mean, by not cutting it back with water, we don't have to chill filter to have the the aesthetic look that everyone wants, you know, as far as that unhazy, clear looking spirit on the shelf. So we just get around that by not having or not adding any water whatsoever. But, you know, there ends up being a lot more viscosity. There ends up being a lot mm-hmm. more flavor nuances that you don't get unless it is done that way. And by not adding any water through the process, well, for one, really putting it in at 110 proof into the barrel, that's a pretty low proof and it ages a little differently than if you were to put it in at um, 125. And, um, you know, you've got more things working in the mix to actually develop that flavor. I'm not going to say faster, but it's more of a robust flavor that comes as it matures Mm -hmm. and the only negotiation that we really have on our production or have had is when we were able to start really laying down barrels we said okay you know we've played with a lot of these smaller barrels like a lot of craft distilleries have and as you get to a more regular size barrel of 53 um, you know the product is comparable versus a five gallon that is a little bit different Mm -hmm. And it ages, it it matures a little bit different. So our negotiation has been, okay, we're going to fill, you know, half our production in 25 gallon barrels and half into 53s. And the 25 gallon barrels are able to really go through their cycle in about two to three years versus a 53, as everyone knows, really needs a good four or so years to age properly and uh, to get to that mature point. So. In the world of the 25s, which is largely what we're dumping and playing with right now, that really is our only negotiation. And by negotiation, I mean, you know, not just laying down 53s nonstop. The the thing about our 25s, they do taste very representative, very close to the 53s. The downside is it costs us twice as much to fill them because a 25 actually costs us more than twice as much on the barrels because a 25 gallon barrel costs more than a 53 because it's not a set production standard for Cooper. Yeah. So it's like custom. Yeah, it, exactly. It's a custom barrel for them. And literally it's, you know, they only run them at certain times. So that's really the only, I guess you could say thing that we've done or negotiation for our production. And part of that is, you know, we didn't buy found bourbon to start with. We didn't start this with a set amount of money to be able to sit on as this product has aged over time. And so in order to put product out in order to transition our business largely to bourbon and whiskey, that's what we've done. So you, you kind of 
alluded to it earlier. You're talking about the mash bill. Uh, I think it was like what seventy seventy eight percent corn, seventeen or eighteen percent rye. Yeah, seventeen seventeen percent rye, five percent malt. Okay. Um, amongst our many recipes, we have a, or at this point, our many recipes, we do have a weeded bourbon, and wheat is a big crop here in this part of the state, in this part of the country, and. Um, we do use local wheat for that. The reason why we use rye starting out is really my fault because being from the New Orleans area, I do like uh, a little spice to my bourbon. Mm-hmm. And so I said, uh, you know, I'm, I like weeded bourbons, but I'm more of a rye bourbon or rye bourbon kind of guy. Mm-hmm. And so th- that was our standard recipe that we developed was with a decent amount of, of rye, having that 17% rye, I mean, that's, that's medium high. It's not super Mm -hmm. crazy high as far as rye goes, but it, it's definitely, there's no question when you taste it, you know, you definitely get some spice from that rye. It's a very big contributor to the flavor, but you know, that, that being said, I'm interested to see what happens with our weeded bourbon as we evolve and who knows that might, be something that we start making more in volume, you know, based on the way people respond to it. Yeah. But you said it was your fault that it's a rye. I wouldn't say it's your fault. I would say, uh, we can thank you for it (laughs) being that way. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Me and Seth, we're, we're rye, we're high rye uh, guys. So yeah. Not, Not to hang any carrots out there, but I'm, I'm also like you, Aaron, and, and probably you too, Seth, I'm a rye whiskey fan too. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and so the cool part is, is, is it definitely connects us with our rye whiskey, largely to some degrees, an in, invert of our bourbon recipe. It still has a lot of corn, the white corn in it. Um, so you, you get that body and the notes from the white corn, but it, it, it would seem almost wrong to not, if we're going to make as much rye as we are, which isn't a huge amount, but it's definitely after bourbon, the largest production that we have as far as whiskey types. If we were going to make that, it would seem almost wrong to have a weeded bourbon and then a rye whiskey, you know, as your main two production, you know, products. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that you you like it a little bit spicier. So with that being said, how, I mean, did you just kind of like start playing with the different percentages to come up with the mash bill that you have or how I've always wondered that, how do you come up with the mash bill that you're using? I mean, obviously you guys play with it a little bit, but right. how, how do you finally set on one saying, okay, this is what this run is going to be. Well, we did uh, early on, we did play with some different recipes and we saw the results of, okay, if you're going to use 25% rye versus 15% and so on. The way we settled on ours was we definitely wanted the white corn to stand up front and to be the focal part of the flavor profile because it's, it's local, it's white corn, it's different, it's unique in that. Um, and, and it's actually softer in flavor in some ways compared to typical yellow corn that's used for bourbon production. So we didn't want to go over the top with our rye, but we did want to have a good, you know, expression of it there. So that's why we did settle on the 17% based on some earlier recipes we did and just thinking it through, you know, we want it to be there, but we don't want it to overdo it. We do have, for example, a recipe we did with, I think double the amount rye, roughly 30%, 32, whatever it is. And, uh, I mean, it, to me, it almost tastes like a rye whiskey. It's, it's great. It's wonderful. But, you know, for, to, I really want it to scream bourbon and I really want that white corn to stand up front. Well, I think based on the samples that Aaron sent me, you nailed it. Yeah, definitely. Well, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the two that we'll be trying? Yeah, yeah. The um, now that we have enough barrels to actually, you know, sample and and go through, we don't have a huge brick house, as Aaron saw. Um, you know, we've got about five hundred barrels or six hundred something like that aging. Um, but we do have enough to where you can actually, as you're tasting them, it. What we're finding is about one out of ten barrels, sort of have a unique flavor, 
and something that, you know, you, you don't want to add to anything else. You want it to be a single barrel. So that's how we come up with our single barrel. Every single one is different. It is not looking for a certain flavor profile. It's they find us. We don't find them, so to speak. When we go through and taste the different barrels, we really like it. We say, you know, this is this has got a flavor that we just don't want to touch. And so we bottle it as a single barrel. So you taste one next to another, completely different whiskeys. It's not like we're, we're, you know, trying to find a certain amount of spice flavor or a certain amount of wood flavor. It just based on the, the feedback, you know, from when the tasting notes really, but when we do our blends, that is definitely something that we're getting into now. That is a whole lot of fun. You know, it's a, it's a hard job, but someone's got to do it is putting these (laughs) blends together and some of these blends it's amazing how you'll add this barrel to that barrel and just get completely you know different animals when it comes to the way that the resultant product is and some barrels you taste and you're like that's good but it's not that great but when you go and you add it to a batch or with a few other barrels it really helps that that whiskey stand up so what we end up having with our batches is there's going to be some variation from one to the next. So this is batch 36 that we're tasting, which will is different from our next batch or our previous batch to some degree. But you'll also know when you taste it, it has a definitive flavor that's representative of us. I love it. So I, I was, I'm looking at batch 36 and it's, uh, it's 680 barrels or a bottle. Sorry. Uh, so how many barrels is that roughly? About that's gonna to be seven? that's gonna be yeah about seven 25 gallon barrels because when we dump a barrel we'll get about so we fill it with 25 we dump it we get about 20 and when we okay. dump that 20 um or, or the 20 gallons that ends up being obviously a hundred fifths and that that right there is about the median of the volume that we get when we dump a two to three year old barrel from from you know, any aging. And so in this case, it was a little light, 680, but it was seven barrels. And uh, so that means that, you know, you might have had a little bit more loss from certain barrels that might have been closer to the end of the, you know, the rick house where the uh, afternoon sun is radiating on some of these barrels. Could have been a leak, which we pay attention to, uh, but that stuff does happen a little bit. And, um, you know, some barrels, Actually, you know, you'll dump and you might get a half gallon or maybe even a full gallon extra, but it, consistently it ends up being right at about 20, 20 uh, bottles. I'm sorry, 20 gallons or 100 bottles whenever you dump it. And so this particular batch, I remember when we dumped it, there was, we actually did two batches at once because we pulled about uh, 12 or 15 somewhere in there uh, barrels that all had this good mature fully uh full flavor you know ready to be done kind of note to them and we ended up splitting them in two because when we started playing with blending different samples from different barrels these particular seven barrels came up with this flavor profile that we liked a lot and we wanted to make a batch and then the rest of the barrels went to another batch or single barrel or whatever so it's it's Literally, as fun as you might think, and we don't do it that often, it's about once a month or so, we'll pull about, you know, anywhere between 20 and 40 samples of barrels that we're pretty confident are there or close to being ready to be dumped. And we'll write down tasting notes and sit around the table and literally, you know, several of us from the distillery, what do you think of this? Is it, uh, is, is it mature? Is it good? Is it a single barrel? Does it need to let, you know, do we need to let it age uh, a little longer to to really get the flavor components that we want? So as far as this batch goes, most of the bourbon, and this is going to be between two and three years old, so roughly two and a half years old, you could say. And that's pretty much the same for anything that we're dumping that's going to be a 25, because once you start letting it go past three years, you really get a a little bit more robustness of the wood flavors that we don't necessarily want um, too much of, you know, because 
as I'm sure you've tasted bourbons that are 15 plus years old, certain ones almost taste like they're overaged and a little overly woody. Mm -hmm. So the single barrel, you got uh, AA 14F12-15. So kind of talk our listeners uh, through what all that means. Yep. Well, the funny part is we've redone this uh, serial code process. So uh, we are getting to the end of this former naming process uh, that's on this barrel. This one's AA, which is our standard bourbon mash, which now we call B01. So uh, barrels that we're filling now, instead of having AA, they'll have B01. And then the 1-4 on there is for first use of the barrel, and the 4 is a number 4 char. So now we have B01A4, because A meaning the first use on the barrel, and 4, of course, number 4 char. And then everything else after that's the same. So F is going to be our month, which in this case is June 12th, and then the dash 15 means it was filled in 2015. So whenever we dump this, It was, uh, you know, two plus years old, and the AA14 is simply, just like I said, our standard bourbon mash, our 78% white corn, 17% rye, 5% malted barley. If this were a dark-fired bourbon, it would be AB, or currently now we use BO2. Mm -hmm. I know, really creative, but, but we're trying to actually be more explicit now or descriptive with the B.O. Being, being bourbon, because now we have all these other recipes. So we've got R.Y. 1, we've got, you know, B.O. 4, we've got W.H. 1 for wheat and so on. So it, it would start getting very confusing if we have all of these different recipes and, and you, don't, you need this whole ledger to explain, well, what is D.A. and what is <laughs> E.B., you know. So um, some people like that because it's almost like cracking a code. but Honestly, it makes it harder for employees and people that work here because then they're walking around. Okay, so they're having to sort of translate it in their head as they're looking at barrels or pulling samples or filling. And so, um, you know, it's 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 one of those things when when we started, it was like, hey, 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 that makes sense. That's our first mash. And that was back when we had like two, three recipes. And now we've got probably, you know, 20 or 30, many of which we only make you know, very rarely. So I'm not saying that we, we have all 20 or 30 whiskeys all the time. Yeah. So speaking of making the product about how often per week are you actually making a product? We run typically about four times a week. Um, and like I said, when we run, we'll make enough to fill a barrel. Capacity wise, if we were to run 24 7, we could fill about 15 barrels a week. And, you know, every year we've made a little bit more. Next year we'll probably go to, you know, six barrels a week and so on. And some of that stuff is actually refilled bourbon barrels that we dump. So it's not all first fill new charred oak aging. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of it is, you know, the, the vast majority of it's going to be bourbon and rye and, and, you know, new barrels that we're filling. But generally speaking, four times a week seems to be sort of the world we're in right now. And as we have more product come out and we, and we dump more and and we can take some of that, that the, the the proceeds in air quotes, I'm I'm doing quotes (laughs) from, from those dump barrels, we can put that into more so that we can fill, you know, whether it be six barrels or eight barrels or whatever we end up doing next year or the year after. Cool. Well, do we want to take a break and try some of this? I think we shall. Yes. Let's do that. Paul, you good with that? I'm fantastic. Yep. Good deal. All right. Well, we'll take a quick break. And when we return, we will share our notes on MB Roland small batch number 36 and MB Roland single barrel AA 14F12 15.
Welcome back, everybody. In the break, we have been talking about and sipping on a little MB Roland bourbon. So per our usual format, we'll let Aaron kick it off. Then we'll hand it over to Paul. And I'll be interested in hearing what he has to say about this stuff since he is the maker of what we're having tonight. And then I will bring up the rear as usual. So Aaron, take it away, brother. So uh, the first thing I want to note before I jump into any kind of review is um, the proofs on these. Um, The small batch is 110.6 and the single barrel is 110.8. So very, very close in proof. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see how this plays out, just being such close in age range and proof uh, to see what the difference between blending and just a single barrel barrel is. On the nose on the uh, small batch, I got up front, I got a lot of uh, like sweet creamed corn uh, that kind of follow uh, toffee and vanilla kind of follow with a little bit of brown sugar. Uh, I get hints of raisins, a little bit of pecans. Uh, get a little notes of chocolate kind of floating in there. Uh, I pick up uh, some nice smoky notes, some nice uh, cinnamon, a little bit of clove, and on the tail end, just little hints of oak. The palate's great. It's it's creamy. It's sweet. Uh, it's uh, it's very viscous. It's got a lot of caramel and brown sh- sugar. I even get some maple notes. I, I get a lot of dark chocolate and cinnamon. Uh, the rye and the pepper really kind of jump out at you. And then uh, get little hints of uh, leather, and uh, I still get that smoky, uh, like a smoky oak. Almost like a campfire, but not quite. And the finish is long. It's real sweet. A uh, lot of brown sugar. The raisins are back. Uh, get some, uh, like, red pepper. Kind of, It's like just a nice um, little bit of cinnamon and uh, just little hints of oak. Overall, this is, it's for a two-year bourbon. It's it's amazing. I've you know I've there's a reason I went down to pick a pick a barrel of this stuff, and it's it's just good. I I give this an 88 out of 100. I I love this pour, and I think it's great. But yeah, I'm I'm jumping right into the single barrel. We're doing this a little different uh, tonight because uh, I just wanted to see what the uh, the difference is. You know, just side by side, and uh, the single barrel on the nose. Um, it's it's different. It's it's very different. It's uh, I get a lot of honey, butterscotch, and vanilla that really jump out at me in the forefront. Uh, then I get some cherries and I get some light banana, actually. a little bit of almond, uh, cinnamon, clove, and uh, just a little bit of smoky oak. On the palate, it's uh, a lot of sweet toffee, vanilla. Uh, get some butterscotch. Even get hints of uh, roasted marshmallows. A uh, little bit of pepper. Definitely get cinnamon, uh, still get some clove in there. That rye, that rice spice is there, and uh, just little hints of uh, leather and tobacco. And then uh, the finish is long, really sweet, almost like a vanilla cake frosting. And uh, some nice cinnamon, cherries. Uh, I give this one a 90 out of 100. Very nice. So, uh, Paul, great stuff, man. You're doing doing some awesome stuff. And for, for the record, we don't get into the nineties that often on this show. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank y'all very much. The, uh, my biggest thing on these two bourbons and I'm, um, I'm also, uh, got the knowledge of, of, you know, how we select them and dump them and, and taste them and everything. The biggest thing with our single barrels that I find, and I know I'm going backwards here, so let me start with the with the batch here, thirty six. It's um, it's got a very full flavor. It always is going to have that because it's obviously uncut, unfiltered, barrel proof, etc. But it's it's got the viscosity, but the single barrel has even more. Mm-hmm. And we we lean towards not always, but we lean towards sweeter barrels on the single barrels, which is why you get a lot of that sweeter more molasses brown sugar toffee kind of mm-hmm. notes on the single barrel but it's also typically going to be a little heavier more viscous um on on this batch in particular on the aroma or on the nose i really get a lot of to me banana nut with a little honey in there um it's it's a little lighter 
than obviously the single barrel, but it is still barrel proof. So you're still going to get a hefty amount of flavor. And really on the, on the palate, to me on this one, I, I definitely get the clove that you're picking up, which to me is always interesting as a flavor note for any whiskey, but especially, you know, for bourbons in general. So get the clove. I get a little bit of a medicine note. Now, when I say that, I don't mean it as a down or, 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 a, or a bad thing. I'm thinking more so a, as a good medicine kind of flavor. I know that sounds really weird, but if you think about some of these bourbons that were made pre-1970, and that was a very definitive kind of flavor note, um, mm-hmm. I get a little bit of that not it's not it's not overpowering like you get with some of those especially going back to the 30s and even before that um it's it's just a a unique flavor and you don't get it with a lot of bourbons nowadays that are you know from the larger producers and then and then on this one of course you get a lot of the sweeter notes but this one isn't near sweet as the single barrel so going to the single barrel on the nose I definitely get more of a brown sugar. I get the spice and I, and I get more of that toffee kind of molasses flavor as hot coyotes are howling in the background. <laughs> <laughs> hold, hold that dog close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Luckily we don't get any too close to the property here because of, uh, uh, we've got our own dogs that sort of keep an eye on things. But, um, but on that single barrel to me, that it, it, it Man, when, when when we taste them, they jump out and they say, hey, I'm a single barrel. A lot of times just with that sweet note that they have, the honey, the brown sugar, the molasses. Molasses is, I guess it goes back to my Louisiana roots. When I get that flavor, I'm just, I get excited. And then on on the finish on this one, I definitely get a little bit of a robustness from the spice, from the rye. To me, of course, for rye, you're going to get, whether it's in a bourbon or in a rye whiskey, you get that definitive kind of mint Mm -hmm. or pepper or heavy spice without saying one spice in general. It doesn't have to be cinnamon, but just a heavy spice kind of flavor. And this one in the finish, it really comes through in that single barrel. Yeah, it's uh, there's a big spice, by the way. I don't I don't mean. I don't get pepper as much as, or, or mint. I get more just spice. Yeah. Yeah. There's a big difference between these two. And I, I had a lot of fun with this. I, I usually try to sample them the night before we record just so I can jot down notes and things like that. That way we're not, you know, spending a lot of time in, in the breaks, but it was fun going back and forth between these two because they're, they're so similar in so many ways, but then yet still just so different. It, it's, and then, I mean, it's, you know, one's a batch and one's a single barrel, but still it's, it just, it makes it so fun to me. Well, what you're, what you're saying is fun to you is also fun to us. I mean, that's, that's really what <laughs> makes this fun to us. I mean, when you, when you can taste one and you're like, this is a completely different whiskey or this barrel or even this batch in some cases, it's just very unique and they have their own expression. It's like you're making, you know, it's like, it's like children, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I know you have a biased opinion, but if you were to give these a score, Paul, what would you give them? Um, well, my, my actual scoring is, is a little different. I know out there like a, in the whiskey world, like an 82 is really bad. (laughs) (laughs) And and a and a ninety three is ah uh, that's okay in some like y'all were saying we don't get into the nineties that often in in my world batch thirty six and the bad part is you know I'm uh, full disclosure I've tasted batch thirty seven <laughs> which is coming out here shortly batch thirty six is probably a mid eighty eighty four eighty five bourbon for me for in our world this single barrel though is definitely 90 plus we're talking 91 92 in my world uh for this particular bourbon but batch 37 i'd put closer to the i know we're not tasting this but that one to give a give an example is going to be like an 88 89 or so um it's just so interesting how some of these different uh bottlings that we do you know and, and it's a lot of its personal preference i'll say that too uh perfect example 
is some people taste certain single barrels, whether they taste them here at the distillery or at stores or whatever, and they think it's the greatest whiskey they've ever had in their life. And I'm thinking to myself, eh, it's not very <laughs> high on my list as far as different stuff that we put out. Well, and that, that's the thing that I, well, both Aaron and I always try to preach is, you know, every, everyone's palate is so different. And you're going to pick up different flavors. There's really no true right or wrong answer. I mean, there's the the consistent flavors that if you if you can pick them out that are pretty much always going to be there. And then each whiskey has its own uniqueness. But I mean, I, I always say drink what you like, how you like it. And I was just going to say drink what you like. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So there's uh, th- and that too is what makes this all fun. It's just there's there is no right or wrong answer, and just find what you enjoy and and go at it. All right, my turn. I'll admit, Aaron, there for a minute. Aaron sent me uh, two samples of these, and he has them numbered three and four, and then has written down what number three and what number four are. And as he was going through his notes, I was looking through mine, and there for a minute. I was wondering if you got mine backwards. Oh. But I don't think you did. I think we're safe. Because you mentioned some of the flavors and some of the aromas on the small batch that I was getting on the single barrel. But anyway, I'll get into it now. Uh, The single barrel, I got uh, very light oak, uh, some vanilla, caramel, super light nutmeg, uh, a little bit of that banana flavor that you guys uh, both mentioned, I believe. Uh, what really jumped out to me was the the darker baking spices, the, um, the cinnamon, light brown sugar, allspice, uh, and then a little bit of honey. It kind of brings back the uh, – I, 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 Aaron, I don't know if you ever heard me mention the, uh, the cinnamon and sugar um, grinder that we have that oh, we use for yeah. like uh, um, uh, toast. That, that kind of brings back that – that aroma to me. Is it like cinnamon toast crunch? Yeah, that, that's exactly what it is. Yep. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. It's cinnamon and sugar. Yeah, it's yeah. good stuff. Um, so I was getting a little bit of that here. Just a, just a great nose, really great nose. Uh, the, the palette for me, it, that kind of, not in a bad way, but it shows to me that it was, that it is a, a younger whiskey than what the nose kind of lets on. Uh, you get more of that that sweet corn, but it's good though. It's a great sweetness that comes in there. It's not like ah, this is young. It's very grain forward. That's not what I was getting here because it's got a fantastic mouthfeel to it. Very creamy, very viscous. Got a great body to it. And I, I had a note here that I was guessing the uh, the corn to be close to seventy percent. And this was before Aaron even said anything to me about the uh the mash bills so i was kind of proud of myself for getting close to it at least anyway uh but on the uh the palate i was getting uh, some of that sweeter corn cinnamon very light honey and oak the corn and cinnamon kind of mingle really well together uh the corn is providing some of that oiliness i think and the cinnamon providing that spice there on the the palate that kind of kicks into the finish uh the finish for me was long surprisingly longer than what i expected it to be uh, starts off with some really great cinnamon spice and it just, I mean, it, it's all over my tongue. It's not just like on the top or the sides or anywhere. It was just all over. Uh, it does seem to get a tad salty. And it's funny because after I finished tasting these last night, I took a drink of water and it tasted like salt water. It was so bizarre. I, I don't know if either one of y'all experienced that or not, but, uh, it, it kind of mellows out after that, uh, some nice caramel and uh, sugar flavors. And I, I liked this one a lot and I gave this one an 87. And this was the small batch, small batch. Yep. yep. All right. So getting into the single barrel, uh, like I said, some of the notes that you both mentioned, uh, specifically you, Aaron, on the small batch, I was getting on the single barrel. And uh, a lot of the same aromas on the nose, baking spices, but they're, it, it's a lot deeper, a lot richer on on the single barrel. And I'm also getting on this one more of that campfire aroma and the darker sugars 
on the uh, the single barrel, I'm picking up a little bit more nutmeg. The allspice I thought was really cool in both of them. It was for me, it was very prevalent in both of them, but more so on this one. And uh, the additional pinch of uh, clove on the aroma here, and uh, it, it just just a fantastic nose. The body on this one, though, oh my gosh, it mm-hmm. was super viscous. Just a fantastic mouthfeel. I absolutely loved this one. It, it's got a good bit of spice to it again. The same cinnamon, uh, not not quite as spicy. I didn't find this one as spicy as what I found the the small batch, uh, but still very enjoyable. I uh, just I really loved the mouthfeel on this one. I can't talk enough about that one on this. Uh, just getting some of that the honey here, uh, the light corn providing some of that sweetness. Uh, the finish was again long. This one was much sweeter than what the uh, small batch was for me. Gosh, just the the single barrel I think I mentioned on the palate, just it covering my tongue. The finish on this single barrel was my entire mouth. It was just it was everywhere. It just like exploded and it was fantastic. Uh cinnamon spice, caramel, vanilla, burnt sugars. Uh, some sweeter pipe tobacco flavors that are coming in towards the very end. It's just a super, super enjoyable whiskey. And I gave this one a 90 as well. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. I, I think you killed it on this one, Paul. It was good, brother. Well, I have to give uh, props to the MB or Mary Beth because <laughs> as we all know, women have better palates than men. Mm-hmm. And and when we go sampling barrels, uh, a single barrel, actually, she has to bless off on it if it's going to be a single barrel. So I might taste okay. it. Our lead distiller might taste it. Folks that have worked here for years might taste it and say, this is great. This is wonderful. But until she tastes it and says, yes, this is good. And, w- and we're very careful about we try not to influence each other. We try to say, OK, you know, we just put it there. We don't say, this is what we think. What do you think? No, it's, these are the samples. What we we let people actually come out with, you know, their own notes and their own assessment of what it is. So um, to me, it's no matter what you're tasting, if you put that in people's heads, a lot of times they're going to go, you know what? Yeah, you're right. Versus coming up with their own actual thoughts of, well, this is what it is, and and this is something that we actually need to, you know, we need to do it as a single barrel or a batch or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny because Aaron and I will, we sample these separately. And it's it's always amazing to me how a lot of the times, I mean, a lot of the times, our scores are very close to each other, if not the exact same. But then a lot of the similar notes, too. and. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I get a kick out of it personally. Yeah. And I think it's fun that we try them separately because as you said, we're not really influencing each other. I mean, when I read my notes, I am literally reading my notes. So the one thing that I'm interested in, it has, uh, has Mary Beth uh, tried the barrel that I picked? I picked. Ooh, she has not yet. The ultimate oh. test. Yeah, I know. Now, now I'm interested. <laughs> Yeah, you need her to try that. Yeah, the barrel yeah, she's Aaron. gonna try it before before it's bottled. <laughs> pass pass the Mary Beth test. No, but uh, actually, but... actually, Aaron, you don't want her to try that barrel because if she <laughs> oh, does she and she likes it, you may not get it. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> no, but uh, that actually is talking about that. Um, so when we did the tasting, um, we we all loved the flavor of it. But um, I, me personally, and I think you agreed with me, it, it felt almost a little too thin. It, it wasn't at that uh, spot that I, I thought it should be at. And I think you agreed. As far as viscosity you, goes. Yeah. And you said, hey, let's let it age till the end of August. And uh, it's going to get a lot of work done in the next month and a half being that it was up in that, that wall brick. And um, so I'm I'm super excited to see how this how this comes out. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about July and August and early September, you know, I I don't want to sit there and put a percentage on how much aging goes on, but it is amazing how much in 
you, you'll taste something, uh, get a sample from a barrel, and literally every two weeks, four weeks, six weeks in that period of time, because of the heat, because of the change in temperature, you know, the ups and downs that you have. And a lot of people, I'm glad you brought that up because it made me think of this. A lot of people talk about the smaller barrels, quote unquote, and the surface area. And I'm here to say, I don't think the surface area is a big, big contributor to the actual maturation process. I think it's more so the physics of the size of the mass that is inside the barrel. And so if you have 25 gallons versus 53, the shift in temperature of that actual liquid that's inside of there is going to be much more extreme on a day like, for example, today when we got up into the upper 80s and then overnight it goes down in, into the 60s. So that that 25-gallon barrel is going to react a lot more compared to a 53 where you have, you know, a little bit, uh, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna flex to it to a degree, but I mean it's it's if we were to pull an actual you know stick a thermometer in a fifty three early tomorrow morning, it might be okay you know seventy degrees, but that twenty five that might be you know sixty five sixty degrees, so it's a big difference. Mm. Yeah, I've never thought about it that way, but it, yeah, yeah that that's, makes, that's pretty wild. Makes a lot of sense. It's, it's yeah. more the mass than it is the surface area. Yeah, at least in my humble opinion, you know, as far as doing the twenty fives versus the fifty three gallon barrels, and then the other issue, or should I say, factor, is um, with a rick house like ours, when you have a, a few hundred barrels versus tens of thousands. When you have 20, 30,000 barrels or whatever they have in, you know, a typical rick house for, say, Maker's Mark or Jim Beam or whoever, that whole rick house is a mass in itself. Whereas ours, not so much. I mean, it's, it's not like the barrels are going to regulate the internal temperature of the actual, you know, barn when you walk in. But you walk into a rick house right now in uh, at, at Jim Beam and you walk in in the you know, middle of the afternoon, it's actually going to feel like it's almost air conditioned because all those barrels are sort of making it that way. Yeah. Because that, that, that whole ambient temperature is, is maintained by all those, those barrels almost being like a radiator. So that's, that's definitely a factor too. When you think about, you know, the difference between a 53 gallon barrel at our place versus a 53 at, a place like Heaven Hill or Jim Beam or whatever. And, um, you know, they, they, they obviously have the differences or variations from one end of the rig house to the other, but we get it, but it's not near as extreme as that, you know, in, in their situation where, you know, on the outside versus the internal portion of the rig house, it's completely different whiskey. Yeah. Well, and the the air probably just isn't circulating quite as much either, too, just because of all the mass in there. I would think maybe. Yeah, yeah, and, and in our world, uh, I mean, we open ours wide open, and you know they get a nice change of temperature uh, day to day, week to week, and so on. Awesome. So the single barrels are they only available in the gift shop, or are those? around uh in kentucky as well um well it actually i just sent out a whole bunch of samples uh to some stores and we're going to let them determine what they want to choose as far as single barrels so we're we're really starting to get more aggressive now with uh barrel picks as far as you know stores or uh, groups of stores, because obviously some of these places, they have like five, six locations or more. Mm -hmm. But but it's also on the table, too, for any state that we distribute in. And the thing is, though, you see single barrel on the label. It's, it's going to be different if you get barrel, you know, A versus B versus C. So oh, yeah. 
Yeah. It, it's it's literally a different animal every time you you go to grab one. In in most cases, and it's if it's if it's a twenty five gallon barrel, it's only a hundred barrel or, or bottles typically. Mm-hmm. It's not that many, so we're starting to put those out a little bit more. But generally speaking, it's one of those where it's got to be the store that really gets behind it and gets interested in in having that unique product. We we thought about initially when we started doing the single barrel where they order up, okay, we want 10 cases of single barrel. We'd send it to them, but I don't think that's going to be it long-term. I think it's going to be more so the barrel picks by the stores themselves. Yeah. And then they say, okay, we, you know, this is ours and it's got a certain flavor and we're, you know, proud to have it. So definitely in Kentucky, they're going to start you as far as the consumer, you're going to start seeing it a lot more. Yeah. So you mentioned states that you distribute in. What, um, how far do you get outside of Kentucky? Well, one of our bigger states is, is uh, Illinois, and obviously Chicago is a big part of that. Um, we sell in Tennessee, Indiana, Maryland, D.C., and Delaware, and we also sell a little bit of product in Louisiana. No reason why we sell there. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. <laughs> but um, what can I do are, to get you to Georgia? I was going to say, what about Ohio? <laughs> well, well, in Ohio, you're not too far from Kentucky. That's the good part. I know. That's why I drive in, down all the time. <laughs> and in Georgia, we're, we're definitely open to going there, too. Um, but we are looking to very shortly here start sending some product to California. Oh, and we've good. been we've been very careful about how we've wanted to do this. It's it's a good fit as far as the distributor, and um, you know we feel like it's the right time to to be able to send the the volume of product that we need to send to make it worthwhile for us. But also, I mean, California is obviously a very very big state, so it's like you know five ten states depending on what you compare it to. So that's that's going to be something that's coming down the pike here very shortly in the next uh, two or three months. And then um, one state that we have on our radar that we're interested in is Georgia, Georgia. I knew it. Georgia. (laughs) I knew he was going to say Texas. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, I got to put you in touch with some people, I think. Well, (laughs) also Florida, because we, we like to go to Florida as often as possible. I'm in, I'm in between Kentucky and Florida. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's all right because my parents are in Florida. So worst case, I could have them pick up stuff for me if you get there. So so let's let's figure this out right now. How about Seth? We just come meet in Kentucky at MBR and we just pick our own barrel. I'm game. Easy peasy. I'm game. Well. I, I've got I have got a segue that with this, so a good time for y'all to do that. Now it, it's going to be pretty busy, but I mean, still a good time would be uh, August the twenty first when the total solar eclipse comes through and the point of greatest eclipse is on Christian County, Kentucky. Basically there, yeah. oh man, <laughs> right here where we are, yeah, yeah. The eclipse barrel. Oh, total eclipse <laughs> of my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Man, that place is going to be a madhouse. I know people back home that are renting out their their homes and basements and stuff for that, but that would be a cool time to do it for sure. Oh, we've, yeah. we've got It's amazing. We've got people from Canada, from England, from California to New York and everywhere in between, and they're coming out here. It's amazing. And during that weekend, uh, we're actually having uh, 13 other distilleries from Kentucky here. And they're going to sample product and, you know, we're going to have a neat little event there on that Friday and, and Saturday. So August the 18th and 19th. And it's 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 really going to be just an interesting uh, type of setup here as far as the people coming in. Um, I mean, this area has been planning it and thinking about it for a long, long time. And it's it's a unique opportunity. I mean, obviously for our distillery, but really for our community, it's it's really fun to see the fruition of a lot of this uh, planning. You know, with all these people coming, 
and it just you know happens to be mother nature saying okay we're going to do this here and yeah. it's in christian county kentucky where the hell is that <laughs> <laughs> long time ago i may have said it was uh god's country i don't know though yeah <laughs> That's really cool, man. That's cool. Yeah, and that's uh, you, we talked about it right before we recorded too. They're they're gonna be. I, I remember them talking about it when I was a kid. The uh, the Interstate One Sixty Nine coming through there. So if they ever finish that, you guys. I mean, you guys are right off of Twenty Four as it is, right? And uh, if, if I or uh, One Sixty Nine comes through, hopefully that'll give you guys even more. Oh, it will. Visibility. It's, it's already been signed into law. Awesome. So yeah, people coming from, you know, where's that running to? Is it Texas? Where's that go uh, to? I can't well, it, we sort of go everywhere from here. But then, yeah, I mean, so I mean, people coming through that area that'll be a heavily trafficked area, and you guys will right. have right, hopefully, a lot more traffic. I would think. Yeah, yeah, with a with an actual interstate, and um, yeah, the biggest thing is that like you were saying, it actually goes all the way down to connects to 24. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good deal. Um, well, I guess Aaron, do you have anything else? Um, no, well, the only thing I got to say is you know, we scored this small batch at an 86.6 and the single barrel at a 90.3. So, uh, she's, these are awesome scores, you know, and, all I have to say is if you're in Kentucky and you see MB rolling on the shelf, grab a bottle. And let your wife try these too, Paul, and let us know what she would score them. Yeah. Definitely. And, and keep that single barrel and I am gonna, hidden I am going to have her try Aaron's barrel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened to the other half of this. I know. We only got, we only got two, uh, wait, four, four bottles? bottles? <laughs> one, one for each of you. What happens? <laughs> Oh, no. uh, yeah. No. Uh, have you have you happened to sample it since since then? Nope. Oh no. Okay. I, I was I wondering if you a, if you actually, tried it. I'm probably not going to touch it until I talk to you next. Okay. And I awesome. mean now. I mean I mean when when we get closer to actually dumping it, I'll I'll give you a holler. Okay. Awesome. Looking forward to that. Uh, I I really want to see how that comes out. Uh, yeah. Definitely keep keep us posted on, on the rye and how everything else is going as well. Cause you have some great stuff coming. And... We don't have any rye. Oh, it's all gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's all gone. It, it, oh, it's man. all in my office. <laughs> <laughs> no rye well, I here. Bet, man. I bet. Oh man. That's tough. That's good. Do you ever come out of your office? <laughs> I wouldn't. Well, no, actually, I wouldn't. The, the, the funny part is, I used to take bottles and um, like when we had, uh, you know, okay, th- take a, a sample bottle of this batch or whatever and put it in my office. I've got a, a liquor cabinet that is, of all things, that is my most prized possession, not because of what's in it, but because the cabinet itself has some history behind it. And without getting into it, um, so it's in my office. It's it's wonderful piece of furniture. It's great. And the... Uh, so I started putting bottles in there and that sort of went away over time as we had more and more batches and I couldn't fit anything else in there. But the funny part is, is I don't go in the liquor cabinet anymore. I just go in the Rick house. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> just fill a bottle pull, up. Pull yeah, it straight. Go. Pull it straight. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, Paul, we appreciate you coming on, man. Where can people find you? Well, um, me personally? Well, you you or your distillery, whichever one you want people to find. I would think both would be fine. But A lot of times I'm at the distillery. So we are in, of course, Pembroke, Christian County, Kentucky, uh, off of I-24, uh, 137 Barker's Mill Road. But our website is mbroland.com. That's M as in Mike, B as in boy, R-O-L-A-N-D, no, not two L's and no W. R-O-L-A-N-D dot com. And if y'all have any questions at all, you can email info, I-N-F-O, at mbroland.com or call 270-640-7744 and ask for Mary Beth. Nice. <laughs> and you have, an Instagram, you have an Instagram page as well, correct? 
We have a Facebook and uh, do we have an Instagram? Yeah. We have an Instagram and we have a Twitter as well. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Instagram is MB Roland Distillery. That's two D's. MB Roland Distillery. And let me check your Twitter real quick. Your Twitter is MB. At MBR Distillery. Yep. MBR Distillery. And the Facebooks, you can just search for MB Roland, I'm sure, and they will come up. And keep a lookout for Red the Cat. He is everywhere. <laughs> Actually, he just walked up. He just walked up. Oh, he knew I was going to talk about him. <laughs> yeah, he says he says hi to Aaron. His yeah, ear, oh, his, hi, Red. His hi, Red. red ears were burning. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron, what about you, brother? Oh, uh, yeah. So you can find me, as always, here on the Firewater Review. Uh, you can find me at Bourbon Cave on Instagram and Twitter. Um, I write single barrel, single barrel, high proof bourbon columns for the Bourbon Zeppelin, and also write for the Sons of Winston Churchill. You fantastic! I am Seth P. Brown on Instagram and hardly ever on the Twitters. You can all always find me on this show, of course. Uh, I also write for the Son of Winston Churchill, that is Son of Winston Churchill on Instagram and sowchurchill.blogspot.com. Check that out. I just put up, uh, or pardon me, Hassie just posted a uh, review that I just finished for Rebel Yell Single Barrel 10-Year bourbon so check that out and uh you can find all of our shows all of these shows and all of the abv network shows in itunes google play stitcher you can find this one on youtube let me try to get it right audio only no video sad you that got I st- it you nailed it ah sad that i still had to think it. about it though and we appreciate your reviews, your feedback. It helps us tremendously, and that would be awesome. So go do that. Paul, also I wanted to mention that you guys have the ability to buy MB Roland Distillery Spirits online. So Correct. go check that out as well. At pstreetwines.com. Yes, sir. Where you can I link to it I ordered a bottle the other day. Oh, did you? Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, they've got several of the products on there. You can link to it off of uh, the MB Roland website and check that out there. I think that does it. Paul, yeah. thanks again for coming on, man. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. Well, thank you all for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good night. It. Good times. Good, good times. Uh, good times. Yeah, definitely. Um, And we'll be in touch. And uh, I'm, I'm definitely hoping to be back down sometime to pick another barrel because – you're you're doing some great stuff. Yep. Absolutely. And Aaron, real quick, speaking of that, what were the final scores? Oh, final scores. Small batch, 86.6. Single barrel, 90.3. Awesome. Yep. Fantastic work. Really, not that I'm trying to change the venue or the direction here, but I'm really interested to see what y'all score our ride. I can't wait to try it. I'd you be interested you, to score it. You, you did <laughs> well, try it, Aaron. Yeah, well, I, I, I was going to say, I, I think when I tried it, I looked at you and asked how much, didn't I? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I guess that 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 tells it right there. I, I wanted to buy that whole barrel, and you said you couldn't sell it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I see a trip in our future. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh, man. I Yeah, I can't wait for that release. We just have to break into Paul's office to get it for right now. Yeah, yeah. It's no, it's right I don't, I don't put anything in my office anymore. Oh, that's right. Never mind then. We know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again for coming on, man. Greatly appreciate it. It was a good time. Cool, guys. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yep. And that does it for this episode of the Firewater Review. Until next time, please drink responsibly and cheers. Later.
The Firewater Review is part of the ABV Network. For more information or to become a sponsor, please visit abvnetwork.com. Thanks for listening, and cheers. Cheers.